This really is exciting stuff. So um, three three years ago, four, five, five now is it really? Dirk, Dirk uh, came in and presented a concept of using Robert Marzano, who's a educational think tank researcher, um, and using his his process for a school improvement process. And so they've had great success at Northeast so far, and um, they're getting to the point where there's going to be some really, some I would call cutting edge stuff and some things to lo look at and think at differently. And so this is an opportunity for us to explain the why behind what's going to occur at Northeast a little bit in the beginning. So okay. all yours, Dirk. Sounds good, thanks. Oh, hey, thanks for coming. It's been a long time since I've been to one of these, so I'm glad it's continued through at least three superintendents and that people are willing to come and, and listen. What makes you the most comfortable? If I stand or if I sit? Is it, okay, all right, as long as you can hear. Um, so as Mike said, I'm the principal at Northeast. Uh, this is my fifth year. Um, before that, I was at Dow High for three years as an assistant principal, which is where um, I first uh, became exposed to the Marzano High Reliability Schools Network, and we started to work with that that year um, when Pam Castle was still the principal. And um, in, 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 in doing so, I really, when I, when I had the opportunity to go, north, go to Northeast, I said, this is, this is something I really want to hit the ground running with. So goals for today, I, I wanted to provide an overview of our school improvement work at Northeast and explain our move now to standards reference reporting, standards reference grading, um, and give, give you some examples of what that looks like. Um, the little packet that I gave you has um, four sheets of paper in it, and those are gonna be the relatively hard to read slides off of the presentation. And then you also have a high reliability schools handbook. And within that, if you wanna thumb through it as I talk, it's perfectly fine, um, you'll see the different surveys and um, give you some background. But the surveys are key for each level because you'll see what they're called the leading indicators and the lagging indicators, which are the survey items, to um, the body of research and what we want to implement in a school in order to get good outcomes for kids. Um, was there anything that you guys were hoping for? Do you just kind of come and like to stay up on the variety of things? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start off. Any, anything that you do, you want to start off with a goal, you don't have to have a vision. So ours at Northeast is that we want to be the best opportunity for all students to make maximum gains in achievement compared to any middle school. And that sounds like it makes sense and that anybody would want to have a goal like that, but if you really look at the, if you really look at the words in there, best opportunity, all students, maximum gains, they're not easy to pull off. So if you're going to do something like that, you have to really look at the body of research that you have available to you to where people have been able to get outcomes with kids. And you have to be willing to do that work. So that's where the, the school improvement framework or the high reliability schools framework from Marzano comes in. John Hattie, I'll start off with this, and your first, your first handout there that I gave you has this particular slide in it. John Hattie is an educational researcher. I can't imagine what this guy's basement looks like or how many computers he has. But he does meta-analyses of meta-analyses. In other words, he takes and tries to find all of the research that's done on a particular area in education and say, these are the outcomes that people got with these particular studies. And he compiles all of it and says, based on everything, ones that had a very low outcomes to very high, here's where you're likely to hit if you do this. So there's 277 factors that he has researched and has ranked within his, his uh, um, items that give you the, the most outcomes or the least outcomes with kids. It goes from the one that gives you the most, which is teacher estimates of student achievement, to the least, which is at a point nine, which actually um, is untreated attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is a, which is a negative point nine. Um, so, and everything in between, 275 more items. What you have here are the top seven on his list. And you can see in the top three, um, these all deal with students and teachers directly. So you have teacher estimates of student achievement. What does that mean? That means that teachers know 
where each child is in their classroom. They are able to estimate where that child is. Why is that important? Because when you get into planning, you want to be able to plan down to the individual. Collective teacher advocacy. All people on your staff have to feel as if they have the ability to be effective with what you're trying to do. So it's not just one teacher here, one teacher there. It's everybody. It's collective. And then the third one is self-reported grades. And if you look at some of the number of students on this one, uh, of, of what he researched, 79,433 students in the sample. This is where students can estimate or understand where they are in their learning. There aren't any surprises. When they can report their own grades and they are in line with where their teacher is, it shows a tremendous impact on their achievement. Now, this is, all, this is all great. But you can't, as a principal or a superintendent, just say, you know what? I read this article, and tomorrow we are doing self-reported grades. Doesn't work that way. And a lot of school districts and schools over the, over the United States tried to do things that way. Very knee-jerk. You know, we're going to put these in. Make it so. Well, you can't. You can't do it immediately. Self-reported grades, solid teacher estimates of student achievement, that takes time. It takes time. And, and so what the framework does, excuse me, go back, is it's, they laid this out based on all the research that Marzano did of all these schools that had success and those that didn't and said, you have to put these things in place in this order and you have to get to this end with each one of those steps so that you have a, a solid foundation in order to move to the next. Self-reported grades is level four. You have to have level one first. And that's that you have to have a safe and collaborative culture. So I'm going to go through these relatively quickly to save time so I can show you more examples of the grading. But level one in the first year, what we had to do was we had to establish basically how we were going to do business, how we were going to handle discipline, what input different stakeholders were going to have in decisions. So when are we going to when are teachers going to have input in decisions? What decisions are going to be made solely in the office? Those types of things. What are we going to get student input on? It's very important that people know they have a voice and when, and then it's consistent. Same thing with discipline. This should be handled in the classroom. This is something that if it's repeated and you've been dealing with it in the classroom, you can send them to the office, and these are the red zone. they got to go. Having that makes a big difference. And so... The other thing is we have to establish when we make decisions, what is our order of priority? And at Northeast, our compass always has to point in this direction. You make a decision, it's kids first, staff second, building third. And me, as the principal, I consider myself the building. Um, so it's always got to be better for kids. It's got to be better for, and then you consider, you know, basically the welfare of the teachers, but we want to consider that always. But... Sometimes those difficult decisions, it seems like, hey, yeah, kids first. People like to say that. I'm always making kids first decisions. But I'm telling you, when you got to make a tough call, like moving towards standards reference grading or implementing some of these things, you know you're going to get pushback. And some people don't, they fear the pushback. And so they start to make decisions out of order. So that would be a building first decision if I was like, huh, I know some parents are going to call. I like it when parents call because I always know where the compass is pointed and I know what I'm going to tell them is better for kids. And I can explain why we're doing what we're doing. And I know that our staff can explain why we're doing what we're doing. So that's very important. And, you, and, and I remind our staff of that all the time because when you're going through change, it's tough. Level two. Once you have level one established, oh, and PLCs, that's, okay, the, that's the whole thing here. Um, professional learning communities is teams of teachers that work together to improve their instructional practices. In level one, you basically get people used to meeting together. Educators will tell you they want to collaborate more, but they don't really know how, so they have to be taught. And that's like that, I think, in a lot of organizations. So we've done a lot of research on teaming, being a good team player. A lot of stuff from Patrick Lencioni, who writes really good, actually entertaining books on how to be a team builder, how to be a good teammate. Um, and then once you kind of have that routine established, you can move into how you're going to coach people. And so we really focused a lot on 
Our, our evaluation tool, which is the 5D Plus, I think it's a really good evaluation tool for teachers from a coaching aspect. That's what it was designed for. Um, that also takes a lot of research on how to do that right, but having that back and forth to get people to improve and try new things is vital. We also have a tremendous learning coach at Northeast. Her name's Jen Lennon, great science teacher at, at Central in the past, had a lot of street cred, and, uh, and she is in line with our vision, and she does a great job, and she's a nice yin and yang for me, you know, um, where I'm, I'm kind of the evaluative person when I go in, still coaching, but she's not administrative, and it's, it's a really good combination. It's worked well for us. Then you move into your guaranteed and viable curriculum. Now, this is where... You guys are here because you obviously care about education for your kids. And you know by going to, you know, or it's a soccer complex or whatever it is, and people start talking about teachers. And they say, oh, man, I hope my, my child gets so-and-so and things like that. And, and some of that might be related to data, and some of it might not be. I understand that. But when you want to have a guaranteed and viable curriculum, that means that no matter what classroom a child goes into, they are going to be working toward the same end. And that how they're assessed, the criteria that are being used, um, that you have time to teach, what is essential, those things are in level three. So you really look at it. What essential vocabulary do kids need to know? And that needs to be taught across sections. Um, what are we looking for with our assessments and so on? That's very, very important. And so not to, I mean, I could probably give you a, day-long workshop on each one of these levels, but to go in through and explain that, it's basically that you teach what's essential, you have the time to teach it, and every kid's going to get it, and you're calibrating across classrooms. Then you get into standards reference reporting, but I have a line there, because those first three, they're not easy to do, but if you're going to go into le level four, you better be ready, because th th we're talking transformational stuff now. I mean, this is where, this is difficult work. And anything that you, any chinks that you had in the armor in the first three levels are going to be exposed when you move into, when you move into grading that way. So we've had a few, and we've had to go back and backfill. But so one of the things in, in level two that we established um, was our common language of instruction. Probably should have put that in there. Maybe that is harder to read than I thought. But basically at the top, you've got, you've got your high reliability schools language. You've got your 5D language. You have our cornerstones at the top. Um, we're going to continually work to develop healthy relationships with kids, maintain and communicate high expectations for staff and students, work with colleagues to develop our skills, and foster adherence to the rules and procedures for a safe and inclusive school. That is expected of everyone that works there. And then you have your instructional, or your instructional essentials. You have to have a learning target. In other words, you have to have a purpose, and it has to be connected to not only today but the future and the past. Engagement strategies where kids own the learning. You have good questioning tactics. There's a lot of discussion. You make good choices, pedagogical choices, teaching choices that are aligned to your goals. Um, you formatively assess. And formative assessment is every time you do something, you're assessing to see if kids are making gains and if you're going to make your learning target. This becomes very easy. I'll come back to this in a little bit when you have proficiency scales and standards reference grading to write that target and, and assess as you go. Because at this point, every activity we have has an embedded assessment. And then uh, your classroom environment it has to be safe, it has to encourage risk taking and so on. So this is hanging in every one of our rooms. We refer back to this at every PD and remember where we are. And when our professional learning communities meet, they have to have a structure for doing so. Um, and so, there are six essential questions that they ask, depending on the work they're doing for that particular day. These probably make sense. First one is, what do we want students to know? Right? The next one is, how will we know if they're learning? All well, those two things right there. <laughs> if you know what you want them to, you know what you want them to know, and you know if, how do you know if they're if they're learning? Then that's pretty much the game. And then what are we going to do if they don't? That's the next question. What if they do if they don't learn? And then how will we enrich it and extend the learning for students who are proficient? You always have, you always have outliers, and you have, to, you have to address them all. And if you think back to that vision statement, we said maximum gains in achievement for all students. If I have a student who's proficient at the beginning of a unit, I still want them to make maximum gains. We don't just let them sit around and read a book. 
So this flow chart illustrates the work that we do. So when we get into the, we determine and, un and unpack power standards, essential standards. Then we create proficiency scales, which are the, is the progression of learning to meet that standard with depth. Then you say, okay, how are we gonna know if they're learning? You, you, what evidence are we looking for? And when you start this, you say, well, these are the kind of assessments we used to do and so on and so forth, but there's a lot of ways you can see evidence of learning if you really open it up and you really understand what you're going for. It could be in a discussion um, of between kids. It could be in classroom discussion. Be, a kid could even generate their own assessment. Um, then you design your instruction, and that's very important. You have to have a goal first. You have to know what you're looking for, and then you choose your activities. And the way, a lot, the way it's been going with education for years and years and years is people pick activities and they hope something sticks. And you need to pick the activities more intentionally so you have that embedded, embedded assessment in there. Then you analyze your data to answer those questions, who did and who didn't. Um, then you remediate or enrich, and then you reflect. And as you can see, this thing's a wheel. I mean, there's nothing here. We never get out of stone and chisel and, and hammer anything in because we're revising all the time. You even have to call into question, did we use the right essential standards based on how the kids did? You triangulate that data to your M step and how they're doing in you know, the next year and, 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 and communicate and say, you know what, we, didn't, we weren't aggressive enough. Or you know, maybe we were, maybe we were too aggressive. So, and so anyway, and then I'll, I'll probably never say that, that we're too aggressive, but um, how we increase our instructional competence. This is okay. What research do we need to do as a team to be better at what we're trying to do and how we coordinate our efforts as a school. Those are the things we talk about in PLCs. I want you to consider this equation. Um, found this at a workshop years ago and it stuck with me. And you know how you find things that kind of make the world make a little bit more sense to you? Um, this helps me. When I talk about people say somebody isn't motivated, I look at this equation. Incentive times perceived likelihood of success equals motivation. A lot of students could tell you why they should do well in school, why they would like to do well in school, but if their perceived likelihood of success is zero, we know from multiplication, we, got no, we have no motivation, right? And you think about some things in your life, you know, hey, I, I'd love to do that, but I don't think I can. So we have to show kids a pathway to success. We have to show them that they can, and they have to be able to see incremental growth. Motivation then builds. You have to prove it to them. Because a lot of times when they end up in a middle school, they've already been in school for six years, K through five. They've had times when you know, they've built this perceived likelihood of success as being very low. Um, <coughs> And so you have to turn them around and convince them otherwise. This is another thing that we use when we consider change. Um, change is difficult. And this is another uh, resource that helped make the world make a little more sense. And, and sometimes when, when you're going through change, you, especially if you're the, the person who's pushing it, like the leader in, in this case, and people will come in and they, com they complain, right? This right here is, makes it very easy to frame what they're saying. So if you want to have complex change, you have to have those five elements across the top. You have to have a vision. We've got to know where we're going. People have to have the skills in order to be able to do it. They have to understand the incentive. Why are we doing this? How does this benefit me? They have to have the resources. Resources and skills are different. And you have to have an action plan. And you can see what happens if any one of those is missing. So if somebody comes in to my office and, say, and they say they're stressed or anxious, we start talking about their skill set. Is there something about this that you don't feel comfortable doing? And, and we help them. Another one is um, resources. Big resource in education is time. And we're always up against the clock. We got the school year, you got the school day, and um, we got to make sure that we're providing resources so that people can work efficiently. Education is kind of known for adding things to the plate over and over, and we never take anything off. So if you know where you are and you're making a change, you're making a change because something else needs to go. And, and 
we have to be very conscious of that. And we, we are at Northeast, and we try to be very particular about entertaining new ideas if, if it's something. And, and if we're not getting outcomes that, we're, that, that we like in particular subjects and things like that, then we, then we start to look. But um, there's a lot of vendors out there that want to sell you stuff. Um, <clears throat> so now, moving into standards reference reporting. Uh, the, the steps that we took, we developed our proficiency scale, so we identified our essential standards. You have three examples of proficiency scales in their packet, and I'm going to go through how, how we use them here in a minute. Um, our teachers developed our own proficiency scales. It took them several years to do it. Um, I think that that is absolutely vital. You can go out and spend with the Marzano Institute $20,000 and buy proficiency scales for every one of the standards that exist but your people don't own them. You, they need to own them, and they need to make those decisions on what it is, what they're looking for. Did we consult those? Yes. You look at models, you look at other things, you consult with other districts. You don't just go off on your own, but when people create it down to the word, and sometimes, for me, I like things to happen a little faster sometimes than other people do, and, and, and people will have a discussion about a particular word in one of those things for a long time. And I realize that process needs to take place. So then, when the kids ask, the parents ask, everybody asks, they know why every word is in there and what this is, and they can make revisions. We're always revising, most times for clarity. Most times for clarity. Sixth and seventh grade ELA and science is where we started. So last year, our sixth grade and our seventh grade English language arts and science teachers implemented this. And then this year, we have it in all core subjects and all three grades except in high school classes like Spanish, French. And we didn't do it in math eighth grade because of algebra. Um, we, share, we share students with Midland High for various courses based on how, and also with pre-algebra eight and uh, algebra, we have kids sometimes that will go back and forth. Kid might come move in, they start off in pre-algebra, like, oh, this, this student could try algebra and so on be very confusing if we were doing one or the other. So when we, we'll iron that out someday. Um, we had student-led conferences. Uh, we started that last year in the spring with the sixth and seventh grade, and it went really well. So the kids could come in. They have their growth folder. They can show their parents all their evidence. Um, and they basically sat down and, and explained what they were doing. And the teacher just kind of walked around and facilitated conversations when needed. And then we did it again in the fall this year with everybody. So... The kids got to sit down, they showed them their baseline data, they said, this is what we're gonna work on. Um, no lines for parents, because they could go in and just, but um, it was nice, it was really, it was really good. And, and some of the teachers that uh, were apprehensive the first time they did it said that, that was the best ones that we've ever had because of, because of the engagement. And we had a lot of people come, we had great attendance. Um, so, and then the last thing um, that we pushed with standards and why we do it, is growth mindset. And you probably heard of growth mindset. You hear it if you watch ball games. You hear it if you, you know, all over the place. There's a gentleman, and that's the power of yet. So we want kids to say, I don't know this yet. And we, we say that with the kids. You don't, ha you don't quite have it yet, but, you know, we're, we're going to get there. Interesting thing, though, with education is you, we have to be careful. And there's a gentleman named Elfie Cohn, who's another big researcher, and um, when, I, when I talk to the kids and mention him, I say, you probably like him because he's very anti-homework. But um, he says schools should not teach a growth mindset. He thinks it's irresponsible. Unless they have a structure that rewards and reinforces growth. He said the way most schools are set up and the way the grading is, it's not growth-oriented. It's summative, and we move on. And there is not that feedback loop and that opportunity to have multiple tries. So without that, he said, you teach a kid to have a growth mindset, but they never get a chance to make a mistake and change it. That's irresponsible. Well, we're not. We're, we're doing our best to have that. So if you're not familiar with growth mindset, I'll give you a couple examples between a growth and a fixed. The top one says, if you have a growth mindset, I can learn anything I want to. Fixed mindset, I'm either good at it or I'm not. People think it's talent. Research now tells us there is no such thing as a math brain. There is no such thing as a music brain. 
It is teaching, deep practice, and repetition. Anyone can learn it. You have to put the time in, and you have to have the correct practice and the correct feedback. Another one, my effort at the bottom, my effort and attitude determine everything. If you have a growth mindset, fixed mindset, my abilities determine everything. One above that, if you succeed, I'm inspired, or if you succeed, I feel threatened. Some kids, like the, with a growth mindset, when I fail, I learn. And that's what Elfie was talking about. Failure has to be a learning opportunity. The brain grows when the brain struggles. The brain does not grow when something is easy. So when you struggle with a math problem, even if you get it wrong, there is much more brain activity than if you know that problem right away. And then with a fixed mindset, when I fail, I'm no good. We don't want kids to talk that way. And I'll tell you what, we all have a fixed mindset and we all have a growth mindset, and it interchanges. And I know that when I was a kid, I was a very fixed mindset kid. So, um, you know, we want better for kids at, at Northeast and everywhere. Yeah. So, um, do you have any idea of percentage or parental engagement increase when you went to student-led conferences versus when you didn't have student-led conferences? Well, the, the engagement, because of time, so our conferences are usually five to eight in the evening. So the maximum that a teacher could probably see if people adhere to that five-minute cutoff is, is maybe 30 to 35 teacher, or parents. Our teachers were seeing twice that because so many more people were coming in and they could, and they could do it. So like our PE teachers, a lot of our auxiliary teachers that get skipped because of time, I mean, they had more people than they've ever had. One of our teachers been teaching there 20 years. She goes, I had more parents than I've had collectively in 20 years. So more people got in the classroom. They got to see what was going on. We told people, if you want to have an individual conference with a teacher, then just schedule the appointment. Because five minutes isn't enough anyway. If it's something where you really want to talk to somebody about something that's important, I mean, a five-minute conference, it's, oh, okay, you're the parent of so-and-so. Here's the grade. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Off you go. And usually the person's like, they've been waiting for two or three hours to see you. It's kind of anticlimactic, I think. So, but yes, we had, we had more people get into more classrooms that way. And they didn't have to prioritize. You just go and say, oh, that one's kind of full. I'll go to the next one and so on. Some people spent a half an hour in there talking to their kid, going through everything. Um, some people didn't need as much time. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I, I just... You know, one of the things that we see is a breakdown is not enough parental engagement. Right. 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 And the partnership that we've had in the past in like the 80s growing up where our parents were engaged, we don't have that today. And right. So the school can't own it all. Are we seeing reinvestment on the parent side? And, you know, and, and there was a lot of parents that, that we had never seen at a conference. So we noted that in, in eighth grade. There's people, and, and maybe the student-led was less threatening in that sense. You know, they're afraid. Of, some people had a bad school experience. I don't know. Now I'm, I have no data to support that. All I can tell you is there was people that came that we had not seen in previous years at conferences. My daughter's a fourth grader at Central Park, and we did that this year where she led the conference. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. But, I'm really on top of it, so I knew everything she was doing, so there were no big surprises, but it was really fun for her to have to own all that. Yes. Say all this and tell. Whereas at Jefferson, for my eighth grader, we very infrequently go because we know where he's at, we know what he's doing, but why waste a teacher's time with us? He had to do, he was there anyway, so my husband went through and talked to a couple of the teachers, but it was very short. He didn't really feel like he got any information. I'm the one who's on top of it. He can ask me a question now. Yeah. But, um, so I found that that student led thing, even though it was a fourth grader, was amazing that she sure. had ownership of where she was at and what she was doing. And she's ADHD. So there was a lot of really good things she had already overcome this year. So it was really, really good. Sounds like the teacher had articulated a vision and, and, and they had set the goals. and then, Yeah. But, and then she asked for feedback, the teacher did. So I was glad to hear that. That's great. Um, this right here, when you talk about learning, um, I like this illustration, the learning pit. 
we want kids to go into the learning pit because that's when, that's when you get the maximum brain activity. And the learning pit is a difficult place to be for a while because you're learning something new. You see you want to go from you know, one side to the other. And on the downslope, you'll hear them say, I don't understand, I want to quit, it's too hard. But as you come up, they start to say, maybe my learning partner can help. I'll try that again. Um, and that's where, that's where the brain activity is, the growth, the learning. It's with the struggle. Oftentimes in education and as parents, it's hard to watch your kids struggle, right? So you, you might give them a little tug or pull them right over the pit entirely, and, and the learning doesn't take place. So as long, the thing with, with proficiency scales that I'm going to show you here in a minute is you're going to see that climb up the learning pit as the kids go. And this is what I found. This is a learning pit for teachers. It's, it's not much different. When we're trying to do something and, and, and change the way people do business, you get the same kind of comments. I don't have time. It's too hard to do in my class. It might work in others, but it doesn't work in mine. I don't think it'll raise achievement. There's nothing wrong with what I do right now. I want to quit. <laughs> and then as they come up, it's prepare, do your research. This is what PLCs come in and utilizing your other staff. Experiment and be prepared to change things. Collaborate. And roll in some quality PD. If, uh, it says if you can leap over the pit, you're not learning any new teaching techniques. We want people to learn new teaching techniques and be challenged. Okay, so your first proficiency scale, this is what they look like. Um, this one happens to be from uh, sixth grade English. And this W4 standard is actually a standard that we use all the way through. So there's a sixth grade version of this, a seventh grade and an eighth grade. Very important standard. Very meaty standard also. There's a lot here. So basically it's to produce clear and coherent writing in which the development organization and style are appropriate to task, purpose, and audience. Man, if we could get every kid to do that, right? So you see at the 3.0. The 3.0 is the goal for all students. We want all students to be able to do that by the end of the year. We want them to use the writing process to develop a clear, focused idea, which makes sense, stays on topic, has a clear beginning, middle, and an end. And they also understand what, why, and for whom they are writing and whether to use a formal or informal style. So they have to be able to do those things on that list more than once you know, throughout the year in order to get to a 3.0. After you develop your 3.0 criteria, you move down to the 2.0, and these are the preliminary, these are the preliminary skills that a student would need to have. In this particular one, if you're gonna, if you're gonna use transitions, you probably need to know what transitions are. So that's what the 2.0 is. Can a student identify a transition? Interestingly though, a kid might not be able to tell you what a transition is, but when you have them right, they may use them. But it's important that they know what they are so that they have success down the road. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we fill in all these. Develop an idea with relevant details. Well, they need to know what an idea developed with details looks like. A lot of times when we're developing proficiency scales, the difference between a 2.0 and a 3.0, we try not to do this anymore, but a 2.0 skill could be assessed with multiple choice or true false or something like that. 3.0 is no way. 3.0 they have to apply. So they're gonna be writing, they're gonna be answering, they're gonna be something more involved. We try not to use those type of tests as much, but that's kind of the differentiation. A lot of vocabulary, identify, understand components. So now, we'll look at the proficiency scale, and then this is, this is a cut from a class. So um, we're experimenting with uh, a different vendor for uh, grading called Teacher Ease because our home access wasn't quite equipped to do this. Um, that's been a challenge in itself, and the change matrix came in. But I want you to look at is this, this first column. You see up there at the top, it says W6.4. The marks that are in there correspond to that proficiency scale that we just looked at. So it's, it's single student horizontally, and then you can look at the class vertically as well on each one. So if you look at pre-assessment for W4 that took place on 918, you can see the majority of the kids had a 1.5. So go back to your proficiency scale, and let's look and see what a 1.5 means. 
It says 1.5, a student demonstrates some success with 2.0 or 3.0 level content without help. So that means that that particular student demonstrated success without help. They could do this independently with some of those boxes. Might have been one. You're not going to know that by looking at this. But the teacher and the student know because the student has a version of this in their folder and the teacher helps them fill it out. So that student knows, I have this. I know what main idea is. I know what I need to work towards. So that's what I'm talking about. When you're talking about incremental growth, you talk to a student who hasn't had a little lot of success with writing and say, we're going to do that 3.0 and there's nothing underneath it. Perceived likelihood of success, probably not very good. But when you start to show them, hey, look it, you're ticking this stuff off over time. This is good. So that's what a 1.5 is. It may look different for different kids, but they know where they are and they know what they need to do to get to a 2.0. We had one student there, third one from the bottom, that had a 2.0 on the initial assessment. Oops. So that means that student could identify all of those things on the 2.0 criteria. Now, let's look at the next column, the personal narrative. It's a different type of task. And you talk about differentiation, which is basically giving students something different. And you talk about RTI or MTSS, multi-tiered system of support, where you look at students that are, that are at risk and you want to give them something different. Look at what the capability is here. Look at that personal narrative. There's kids all over the place. I have kids that are 1.5s. We saw what a 1.5 is. Now, that 1.5, some success, you're still at 1.5 until you check all these off. See what I mean? But they, may, they know if they've made growth, they might have checked off a few more. I have five kids just in that snip that I had 1.0. A 1.0 says that that student demonstrates some success with 2.0 or 3.0 level content with help. On that particular task, they did not do it independently, any of it. And then, down here, I've got a 2.5. Whoops. So this student did everything in the 2.0. 2.5 says demonstrates all 2.0 content with, with some successful demonstration of 3.0 content. So as a teacher, what do I do? Well, do I just teach the 1.5s? It's the majority of my kids. No. I have to do something different because I have different groups of kids in my class. This is the great thing about using proficiency scales created by staff across classrooms. Remember I told you about guaranteed and viable curriculum? The other English teachers have the exact same scales. They have kids. They have scores. So they can collaborate and say, I got a few 1.0s. I got a couple 2.5s. Boom, they start switching classrooms and they, and they do lessons that way. Or maybe you create and do a mini lesson for the ones. The 2.5 could help you a little bit with teaching some other kids and helping them compare their writing to others. Nothing's better for brain growth than teaching. So there's a lot of options that you have there. So, and you can measure that growth to the next. You can see a lot of those 1.0s went up to a 1.5 again and so on. You've got kids at 1.5, 1.52 just in that particular standard. So you're starting to see how this works? Okay. Now, uh, this one's a science one. Seventh grade, this is, and we use science and engineering practices as our, as our end all here. I'm not going to read that whole paragraph at the top. That's why I'm going to let you take it home. But basically, again, you've got a 3.0. And the essence of this SEP4 is that students can graph information correctly and they can interpret other people's graphs. So they can look at data in graph or table form, and they can interpret it, and they can convey information by using a graph. So if I look here, SEP4 is right here in the middle. Um, and you can see there's a column there that only has one score in it that I'm going to get to. You can see here again, the variety and the range within a classroom, right? So I had a student, the, the second one from the top had a three on the first strongest tissue graph. So what does that mean? What, is, what did that kid do? That kid constructed a graph using data, had a title, 
accurate axis labels, categories and numerical intervals proportionally spaced, accurately displayed data, choose the appropriate graph representation, had a legend and a key if needed, and was able to interpret the data. That's tremendous. It's a seventh grader, right? Well, guess what? That's where we want all our kids to get by the end of the year, and they will. That's the goal. So it changes with content. So that student had a 3.0 on that one, but the next time there's a 2.5. So they understood in the 2.0, they could, they could identify all the components, but there was something missing. Maybe that one was looking at somebody else's graph and being able to interpret. That might have been missing a little bit there. I don't know. That student knows, though, and that teacher knows because they're keeping track in their growth folder, and they're keeping, keep holding on to that evidence that was scored so they can look back, and they can see what they did three months ago, and they can see what they're doing now. And it's amazing. We did some uh, pre-testing in sixth grade last year, and we asked the kids to do graphs. But we, the teachers did. I looked at them later. Some kids made frowny faces with tears. That was their graph. They didn't know how to do it at all. At the end of the year, you see these beautiful graphs that kids have, you know, they've used their straight edge and, and, and all the components are there. Um, one teacher that we have in seventh grade, she said, we've been underestimating kids for a long time. Long time, you know, to what they can do. <clears throat> so this two, the .5, you see that kid up there who had a .5 in the first assignment. We had several. .5 says the student does not demonstrate any 2.0 or 3.0 level criteria even with help. So they're not demonstrating anything at that time, but that little magnifying glass says that something's missing. They didn't turn it in. We didn't have learning evidence. So we have to differentiate with these assignments whether or not a student is a, at least a 0.5 or a 1.0. Can they do any of it or, or without help um, or none of it with help and so on? So, and then you can see that one that's almost a blank column. The neat thing about this too is students can generate assessments. Or a kid could say, hey, can I, can I try this again? You can enter it in there. So that kid has a third data point as, as uh, he took the shot at it again, 2.5. And that was an optional graphing exercise. Because it's not percentages, you know, you can look at it and you're just looking at the data that you collect. Some students that um, may not be there yet, we might have 10 data points on them to see if they're at a 3.0. There might be some students that you don't need that many. You know, you're moving on other things. So, because we're constantly try again, try again, try again, work with them, coaching, so on. And the last one that I have for you here, I just want to be conscious of your time, um, is a math one. This is out of pre-algebra 7. This is content related. And you can see the 3.0. You have the entire one. When I did my snipping tool with this one, it, it didn't jive, so I don't have the 2.0 here on the screen, but you have it in your handout. And uh, you see here, solve multi-step equations in one variable is the essential standard. So in order to be at a 3.0, students have to be able to solve integer multi-step equations, including just using distribution, combining like terms, keeping the variables on both sides. You remember all this stuff when you had these classes? <laughs> you have to do those rules. No solution and infinite solutions. Solve equations with rational numbers. Give examples of equations with one solution, infinitely many solutions, or no solutions. So as we look at the class, you can see that the different components within that proficiency scale have been measured. So if you look at a student across, like the top student, they had a 3, 2.5, and a 2.5. And it'll tell you with the rational equation, they were a 2.5. The multi-step equation, they were 3. See what I mean? So all you know. What we notice in math all the time is we do not teach enough to mastery. So kids struggle with fractions from elementary school till their senior year. They struggle with decimals. They struggle with negative, positive and negative signs. See it all the time. So we have to know those specific things and go back and give them an opportunity again and to reteach. If I look at this, um, you look at the special case equation, the kids did pretty well. And this, you know, most of them are threes. You got a couple 2.5s, and you have one 2.0. And that kid's been a 2.0 across for this whole unit. So if they're a 2.0, um, they can't do any of these things uh, by themselves. We need to differentiate for that student. Fine. 
Then you can see um, some of them had threes on, on some and only a 2.0, 2.5s. But these kids, we need to go back because you think of a percentage-oriented system, 85%. Hmm. B, sometimes people are happy with that, fine. But if a kid misses 15% of the content over and over and over and over again, that's a lot. So we don't want that. Our goal is kids get maximum gains and achievement, any student. So this looks like, when you look at that assignment on 1121, that teacher did a pretty good job. They did a pretty good job teaching that part of the unit. Kids did pretty well in the assessment. I only had one 2.0. No, no. And then you, you talk to other teachers and, and you figure out how you're going to do it. A lot of this is peer coaching too. They're able to sit down and look at each other's work. They do a lot of error analysis together. You hand back the work, there's that score on it. Figure out why is yours a two and theirs is a three. And they have that dialogue. And it's very valuable. Instead of it just being teacher to student, the more responding and feedback opportunities you provide, especially when they're, uh, they're centered around that goal, it's super powerful. So, like I said, it, in, in the time that we had, I could do, give you a three-day workshop. You'd be bored out of your mind. But... Um, this is what we've realized the benefits so far. As I said, our PLC work is greatly enhanced by doing this. We're in constant conversation about student learning and, and, and evidence. Students are more motivated because of the motivation equation. You see that their perceived likelihood of success goes up, they have incremental growth, and they start to own the learning because they see what they need to do. What's pretty cool is when you go into a, into a classroom and you see a, a, a whiteboard that's designated to when kids come in and say, I can help, I need help, and they just put their name up there, and the kids start working together. That takes a lot for students to even admit that, but when they know that that classroom environment fosters risk-taking, and they know that their needs are going to be met, and they're going to eventually be successful, it works. We see student growth. Um, we've been happy with what, what we've seen so far. Our PSAT scores for four years in a row, each, uh, each class has beat the one before, so we've had four years of increase. Um, you know, index scores are embargoed. We, we like those so far, but um, there's a lot of things. We're, we're a lot better in being intentional with kids and the outliers for the RTI. Uh, our teaching is way more intentional. It's all based on how the kids did and we're me measuring. And it's student-centered against teacher-centered. It's not just, I want to get through this content. Um, I'm gonna, I, I did this and, and the kids didn't get it, so what am I going to do now? And the kids have that one-on-one -on -one with teachers all the time because they have to. Each one has a little bit different profile. And a lot more deep practice because it's very specific. Um, so that's, that's what I have. Questions from anybody? <laughs> so when they're in a two to a three, do they stay in that content until they get it to all the kids at a three? or just that they're each progressive? In English, social studies, and science, we work on that all year long. All of those are, are all year. The difference is math because with math, they, uh, it builds. So you have, to, you have to make sure that for each unit, the kids get there. But if they don't, we have to make sure that we're going to go back and backfill. You may see, see evidence of it later, too, when you're using another unit. But at least the teachers know, here's where my kids are as I move on and make sure that I'm going to come back because we can't, um, no, you can't stay in one spot and then you know that that hole is going to be there. It's going to get you later anyway. It's going to get the kid. It's going to get the teacher. Um, so, it, it, but like in science, they work on all those different SEPs. What changes is the content. The expectation is the same. So you're going to graph the water table and then you graph nutrition and, and those types of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and for English, that writing standard, I mean, they start that at the beginning. They work on that 36 weeks, you know. Um, any other questions? Is Northeast the only school doing this right now? So far. It's taken us first. This is our first year with the whole building. We did, uh, um, it's taken us, well, this is our fifth year working with the framework. Um, and it took us that long to be ready. And it was even a thing, too, this year where people are like, Mike, listen, guys, we got to jump off the boat and see if we can swim. I mean, you can't, you can't sit here and wait and plan and plan and plan forever. I think we're ready to go. I think we're good. And the, the thing is we had the PLC structure in place. We had the coaching thing. We knew we had several uh, 
life rings we could throw out in the water, so to speak. Um, share a little bit about, just for example, and only off the cuff, your data yesterday with your subgroups, because I think that's really powerful. And Can I share those yet? Are they embargoed? In generalities. In generalities. Generalities, okay. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the state of Michigan always has a, they have different ways of grading schools, and so right now they're using a school index. And um, we were able to, we're now able to see our 18, 19 school indexes. And our school index improved qu quite a bit. I mean, and we were really excited. And so you can look in there and say, well, what may have, have caused that improvement? And it was substantially better growth with students who are economically disadvantaged and those that were in special ed. And that's a group that... It's hard. We struggle in the hard, but so does our whole nation. State. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's and totally off the couple. We can give you more later. But yeah. That's what, the, what I looked at yesterday, and what I look at you doing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it meets all the kids' needs. Mm -hmm. But we maybe found a way to get the growth of some of those other kids. Keeping them engaged and your learning pit worked for me with those. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. And and when they've been in the pit before and they don't come out, yeah. it's um and then some of the kids too. Some of the kids that have struggled over the years, a lot of people just keep pulling over top of the pit. And let's be honest. I mean, special education and response to intervention, well, it has a large effect size, but, but we got to let those kids struggle too. We just have to be there, and they have to see the growth. They're held to these exact same expectations, and they are meeting them. We had kids that did wonderful stuff. We had a girl last year that went up 60 standard score points on the M-step. I mean, it's not even, you don't even hear that from one year to the next. She was tremendously at risk to proficient. And so, now it doesn't happen with everybody, but um, this was a situation where the student bought in. She was a selective mute at the beginning of the year, and by the end of the year, I mean, she is just, we actually had a video um, where the kids talked about proficiency skills, and um, she was on there, and it was really interesting to hear her talk about it. So, um, so it sounds like you're doing some more individualized things, and I, I, when you talk about the pit, some of those people can fall into the pit, and it's tar, and they're by themselves. Mm -hmm. so you have somebody who's going to walk through that pit right. with you. Right. It makes all the difference. Absolutely. Uh, differentiation with intentionality, is, I yes. think it's one of the parts. We've always done differentiation, but I don't think it's ever been... Well, and, and I love to do your hurt. You said it with better research than I've said it, but I've said it for years. We don't make progress until we individualize. And you said that earlier. Well, yeah, and, and when you think about you're going in the learning pit, it's like, okay, you're going in the pit, but here's your proficiency scale. This is how we're going to get out of the pit. And I know exactly why you're in the pit and how I'm going to help you get out. So as we start making our way up the side, boom, boom, boom. But you look at that thing, and you're like, I'm never going to make it up that. Or where's the bottom? You start sliding down here, hoping to just hit bottom first. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the same thing with adults. We all go through it. And well, that's just tough. And allowing kids to struggle well. <laughs> and it's okay His to struggle. There's little math equation. It's okay to struggle. Like, good, good math equation, you can take it backwards and it's still coming. Yeah. <laughs> I would think it the other way. Motivation comes from the other. Exactly. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, it does. You, you, and, you know, and, and the last thing I want to do is tell you that this has been rosy and all that for everybody. It's been an adjustment for different people for different reasons. If you're a student that got all A's all the time with the old way, they don't like this so much. Some of them don't like this. Hey, I like the game the way it was played before. I could memorize things. I could take the test. Give me a bunch more stuff. I'll memorize it. Boom. You know, I got a system here, man. You want me to think and explain? You want me to, what? And then some of the other kids that are in the back, they're like, oh, I've got to memorize, I've got to study, i got to do all this stuff. And they're like, wait, I can explain this a different way. It's different. So then you start to see why having a very heterogeneous class is beneficial, more so than, than tracking maybe, because you get those different types of learners in there, and, and it's good. Our co-taught co classes are better than ever because now everybody knows what they're working on. That co-teacher can work with any student in there and vice versa because they have proficiency scales, the kids are working, they're having that dialogue. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the discussions that we have in those classes are, 
are really interesting as the kids kind of chirp in, especially social studies and things like that, different life experiences. It's it's a different way of looking at things. <clears throat> like we often do, we fill the whole hour, so we'll stop. Is that it? All right, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks.